everybody. Are you warm? Look at this fireplace. We're going to just be. Yeah, sorry. No marshmallows. It's not made for change order. So uh, I'm going to do a quickie intro. Uh, we're, I'm just so delighted to have Dr. Amin Patel with us today. He's one of our polyclinic cardiologists, general cardiologist. He's awesome. He's also the uh, director of our, of our echocardiography lab. And if you don't know what that is, he'll explain that. Um, he has kind of an initial presentation just uh, at the very beginning. So please hold your questions because then we're going to sit down and have a nice fireside chat. So uh, without further ado, here's Dr. Amit Patel. Uh, thanks for having me. I figured um, I would give a brief kind of talk about the heart um, because in general the heart is, in, at least I'm quite biased, kind of this fascinating thing that sits inside of all of us. Um, there's lots of different types of hearts. Um, every single heart in the room is very different and um, I figured when you're thinking about the heart you should have some very basics um, just so you guys can, uh, this hopefully will stimulate a couple questions. Um, and uh, so uh, Dr. Baumgartel has some handouts for you that has the, my favorite website of all time. Um, and it basically has everything we're going to say plus more. Whenever you guys have questions about the heart, in general, I avoid Google. So Google is going to have <laughs> And I have no idea where it's coming from. So this is pretty good information from the American College of Cardiology. It's mostly evidence-based, so stuff that um, is peer reviewed by other doctors that hopefully will help you out. So take a look at the website if you guys have questions. Um, feel free to ask me too. Um, so the heart, as very basic as an engine, okay? You have like thousands of cars trying to get home right now. Every car has this kind of, you are like an engine. Um, you've got one right here. It's silent, it's supposed to be silent. Um, it's got an electrical system that runs it, and I'll review that with you. Um, and your heart, and most people don't know this, has its own skeletal system inside of it. Um, and that skeletal system can have trouble, um, and it can lead to something called valve disease. Um, it also has a basic brain-like response system and a backup firing system because we need our heart. We need our heart to pump blood to our brain, to our vital organs, everything that you need to keep on going throughout your day. Um, and it responds to lots of different types of signals. Okay? It responds to stuff that's coming through your eyeballs all the way down to your heart from your gut. It responds to your lungs. It responds to your blood volume. If you're anemic, if you're in pain, if you're scared, if you're resting, if you're eating, it listens to lots of signals and it tries to figure it out. And it does that without having billions of nerves like your brain does. It has just a very basic rudimentary system. So sometimes it can get discombobulated and it ends up making people come see me. Has anybody seen a cardiologist before? Yeah, we tend to be a little bit scary sometimes. Um, my job is to make it a little bit less scary for you. Um, so basically, it's a pump and it's got a bu bunch of tubes connected to it. So I'll show you those. It has two inflow valves and two outflow valves, um, just like doors that come into a room. They open and close. They should work that way. And about 50% of what comes in the house in the heart should actually go out. So when I say, or a cardiologist tells you your heart functions at 50%. That sounds really scary, but that's actually very normal, okay? Um, on average, it pumps about 60 to 100 times a minute. So when somebody says your pulse is 95, don't be terribly scared about that. That is within normal limits. And it's supposed to go much faster when you're exercising. And it can go slower than that when you're sleeping. It can beat about 50, 40, sometimes 30 beats a minute if you're an exerciser. So the heart can be very different depending on who walks in the room. And the thing that we all tend to forget is that it's been going since before you were born, right? It's, the heart starts beating at about 22 days uh, from um, actually a, when the sperm and the egg come together. 22 days later, there's actually a heart that's a, a kind of a rudimentary heart that's beating. So by the time you are 77, some of you might be there here in this room, we don't know, um, it's beat 3 trillion times, 6 to 3 billion. So when I'm seeing a 96-year-old person in clinic, it's been going four or five trillion times, and it's allowed to have some issues by that point. Okay, um, so just like the engines in the cars, uh, and there might not be a lot of car people in this room, but in general, there are inflow valves that allow the fuel or blood for us to come into the engine, and outflow valves that allow it to come out, and it basically makes the body work. So if you think about 
cars that are will last maybe 15 to 20 years, we last much longer than that. So I am impressed with human beings. And if you take a look at kind of the history of what we know about the art, we really didn't know much until about the 1800s. It was basically magic before then. Cardiac surgery, changing our heart valves and bypass surgeries, that didn't really start till the 1950s. It was being experimented on in the 1800s, um, but they did very poorly and everybody died back then. Um, so um, you don't have to die nowadays, which is really nice. Um, most of what we learn about the heart is after listening to it. Um, and this is uh, Rene Lenec in 1819. And this was um, the precursor of the modern stethoscope looked like this. It was just this big wooden tube. And they, he figured out that if he could roll up a couple pieces of paper and listen to a kid with tuberculosis, that he could hear things. And he didn't know what he was listening to. Ultimately, he realized that he was listening to heart valves beat and lungs move. Um, and then years and years and years of innovation kind of led this through to something that sort of looks like a stethoscope. I met some crusty old doctors when I was training that still use some of those things because um, they didn't want to give them up. But nowadays you see us all carrying this thing, right? This thing is still, it's totally outdated. It is the best thing we have because it's cheap and it's reproducible and you can carry it in your pocket and lose it and not be the end of the world. However, our ability to really understand what's going on in the heart um, is not perfect. You have to have somebody on the other side of this listening really well for it. So, Somebody's putting that on your chest. Hopefully you trust them to understand what they're hearing. Okay? Um, and what we are listening for is this turbulence. So when the doctor is putting something on your chest to listen, we're listening for turbulence. Your body should be quite quiet. We are an amazing system that has lots of things that are moving and swishing around, but we don't really make much noise if you um, have ever listened to yourself. Sometimes you can probably feel your heart beating in your neck when you're sleeping on the pillow. That's because there's no other stimulation at night, and you're not listening to the TV or the sound of the road, but you're hearing that blood flowing. What a doctor is listening for is basically one of two things. Are things moving forward and very easily, like kind of water in a river, or are there a lot of problems with that river, and is there a lot of turbulence? And so if there's a problem in blood vessels in particular, we can hear a lot of turbulence. So. Basically, if there's a problem in your heart and there's something called stenosis or something's narrowed down or some valve is leaking a little bit, the doctor can kind of hear it. And it sounds kind of like that. Um, so not a lot of people listen to hoses, but if there's trouble with blood flow, it tends to speed up and you can hear it. So that's what we're listening to, just so you guys know about that. Why are we listening to your chest in specific spots? It's because your heart has those four valves I talked about. We listen in four specific spots to listen to each of those valves. Um, so if you find a doctor that maybe just listens right there and walks away, it's probably not the best um, examination you've had in your life, and you probably will have better exams. <laughs> you might want to go, hey, doc, um, what would you hear? Um, so you know, an orthopedic physician might listen there because they're more focused, focused on your joints. But if you see an internal medicine doctor who's very skilled or a cardiologist, in general, we spend a lot of time listening. It's very cheap. It doesn't hurt you to do that. Um, so expect a good exam if you see one of us. But all of that has improved over the last kind of 20 to 30 years. So, um, you know, in the 1950s, 60s, World War II happened. Not 1950s, 1940s, sorry. Wrong. Sonar, right? Um, so. Sonar was developed to look at things that we can't see. If we send sound into something, we get a reflection of that sound. We realize we can use that in medicine. So ultrasound is used everywhere in medicine, and it's used in particular in the heart because if I send ultrasounds into your chest and it bounces off stuff, I can make a picture of your heart, and that's called an echocardiogram. So if you've seen a cardiologist, sometimes we often like getting these because sound is not painful, first of all. It doesn't hurt you. There's no radiation involved, um, and there's no needles involved, usually. Um, and we can get lots of information. So if we put an ultrasound kind of at the top part of your chest right here underneath your left breast, your heart looks like that. Oh, let's see. Do I have to play it again? Oh, it's just automatic. It's doing it. Yeah. So this might not look that much to you, but that's your heart beating. That's what it looks like in most people. Those are the four chambers of the heart, and that's what it looks like under ultrasound. 
that's a mitral valve right there, a tricuspid valve opening and closing. And it's going there, and it's usually supposed to be quite silent. So right now, it's happening in every one of you right now. I mean, this is the right ventricle of the heart. This is the right atrium, the left atrium. Those are the filling chambers. But things continue to get better. So this thing got cut off. It's not the year 201, but it's 2017 now. So ultrasound, you know, started off in the 19, I don't even know, 1970s, we started looking at ultrasound of the heart, but we only used to be able to see one thing in one line, kind of like looking for fish underneath water when they're fishermen. Things have gotten much better than that, hopefully. Um, we can do 3D pictures now, uh, where we're actually looking like right into your chest, and we can look in different directions and see what's going on. And we can actually watch blood flow move as it moves through your heart, and actually do, most recently, as of 2017, we're starting to look at things called volumes, where we're actually measuring exactly how much blood is moving through your heart over time. And is it low, is it not, too, not enough, is it too much? Um, and these things are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, like everything else is. You know, everybody has a computer in their pocket nowadays. So just about a month ago, I eventually, uh, so the polyclinic has two of these, and we're taking them around in the hospital using them instead of wheeling this huge thing around. So I suspect, I suspect, my hope is that not all the doctors do this, because if not all doctors should do this, that you'll see cardiologists in clinic probably in the next about five years checking out your heart right there within probably the first 20 minutes of us seeing you. Because in general, it's a little bit better than just looking at you. And we get a good idea of what's going on quickly if you're not feeling well. So I have a feeling it's going to be on the road. All right. So taking it even further, we have things like cardiac MRI, which we introduced about a year ago. Um, we can do it now at Swedish Medical Center. So most of the cardiologists, there's two of us, Kira Hunegaard and I, and Jim Willems, have the ability to look at MRI. Let me see if I can play this. MRI, is, has anybody had an MRI before? They're loud, clanky, mm -hmm. they take a long time, right? So you never should get this multiple times. However, it is the best way well, that we can understand how blood flow is moving through the heart and how well the heart is actually pumping, um, other than cutting out your heart, which we don't want to do. Right? <laughs> um, if we're sensing that there's trouble with the vasculature around your heart, we have the ability to do MRI without hurting you. Fortunately, MRI has no radiation. The only thing that's really annoying, you've been in that MRI tube. I haven't had an MRI, but everybody who gets one tells me that they, in general, didn't like it. So. We have the ability to do it. Just don't have to do it in everybody. So everybody's probably had a chest x-ray at some point. Very basic te technology. And this is what they had, just their ears, and they can do x-rays. So they figure out if the heart's in the middle of the chest or on the wrong side of the chest. Um, that's part of what we could do. So if anybody ever sees a cardiologist, talks to their primary care doctor about chest pain, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, there's a lot of things that could be, right? Um, so. Don't be overwhelmed by it. The doctor is going to end up having to take their time through there because there's a lot of things in the chest that can cause those symptoms. Just looking at this, if you take off the chest wall, there's a lot of stuff here, right? You've got lungs. You've got the lining of the lungs. You've got your diaphragm that can cause discomfort. You've got your stomach and everything underneath here that can cause pain. You have the lining of the heart on the outside. You have all the nerves up here that can get discombobulated. Some people have thyroid problems that grows down in this way. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in the chest that can cause chest discomfort. So that's why you find your cardiologist or your internal medicine doctor doing lots of tests, unfortunately. If you start peeling away things, you notice here that this is the heart in the chest, it's in the middle here. It sits right on top of your diaphragm. So sometimes when you have indigestion or if you ate too much, there's a lot of gas. You're like, is this, is this chest pain or is this belly pain? That's why they call it heartburn, right? This heartburn is from your gut, but it feels like your heart is hurting, but your heart isn't hurting. And the reason why it's called heartburn is because this is your esophagus right here, this little muscular tube that sits right behind the heart. And your esophagus, unlike your fingers and your eyeballs, don't have nerves that tell you exactly where pain is. And that pain is radiated out into different places. So if you're having 
an ulcer that's there because you're drinking too much coffee, too stressed, working too hard, eating too much chocolate, drinking too much wine or whiskey. <laughs> Sometimes you get an ulcer there, you get an ulcer right here, and guess what? That really hurts, and you're like, oh, that's painful. Do I have chest pain? Do I need to see a cardiologist? Start off with a primary care doctor. But if it's really severe, you're really short of breath, you get it checked out quickly. It's, it's hard to tell. You have to have a doctor who will kind of talk to you a little bit about what you've been eating and what you've been drinking, how stressed you are, and then check out maybe an EKG. So there's a lot of stuff in that chest. You'll find me talking about coronary artery disease a lot. So coronary arteries, in general, are clogged. Okay, so the United States, if you grew up in the United States, you probably eat a diet that has, in general, more trans-saturated fats, a little bit more sugar than everybody else, um, and you might have a little bit more stress than other people. Your blood pressure might be a little bit higher. So that tends to cause inflammation in these arteries, the arteries that supply your heart muscle. Because it's beating trillions of times, your heart needs a lot of oxygen. And those arteries that supply your heart need to stay open. And sometimes when, you're, when you actually get chest pain that's from this, you have chest pressure in the center of your chest, you get shorter breath, you'll find a cardiologist will probably be testing these by different types of tests. These are the coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries sit on top of the heart muscle and, and dive down into the muscle and supply it with oxygen. This is your right coronary artery. This is the left anterior descending artery. There's an artery that goes back around called the circumflex artery. Basically, I think of them like trees. Okay, if you look outside, think of a tree. There's a trunk, and then everything comes up to the tree, and there's little branches and tinier branches and tinier branches. So those are all those little tiny branches here, but this is even more simplistic. There are billions of arteries in your heart. The little tiny ones can cause chest discomfort too, and they tend to get clogged up first before the bigger arteries get clogged up. So in general, doing things like being part of this group and exercising, eating, eating well, being well, keeping your stress levels low, keeps those guys happy. Right? If you keep your blood vessels happy, you actually keep most of your vital organs happy, you tend to live longer. It's kind of a known fact. If you treat the blood vessels not well with like smoking and your diabetes is relatively uncontrolled and you're eating lots of sugar, there's going to be a lot of inflammation in these blood vessels. And inflammation scratches those blood vessel walls, and plaque likes to sit on those walls. Okay. I think of blood vessels kind of like the wall in this room. You kind of want the blood vessels to be very smooth. And the things that injure those blood vessels are high blood sugars, spikes in blood sugars, high blood pressure. So if your blood pressure is really high, that means somebody is sitting inside your blood vessels and constantly pressing on creating little cracks, and those cracks allow plaque to sit in them. Um, so you'll find me talking about that in clinic a lot and pressing on the walls in clinic. Um, so I talked to you a little bit about the electrical system of the heart. So this engine requires something to beat, right? It's a muscle, but it's, it doesn't have its own brain system. What it has is its own natural pacemaker. You guys are all born with a pacemaker. It gives off electricity, and it if there's a bear in the room, or if you're super scared, it decides it wants to be faster. If you're sleeping, it slows down. If your blood pressure is high, it actually slows down to try to reduce your blood pressure. And what it does is it sends off electricity to these big fibers of nerves inside the heart muscle. And these things can also get discombobulated, and that's called arrhythmia. So if you've heard that term, arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, PVCs, tachycardia, those are all coming from the electrical system of the heart. And we actually have specialized cardiologists that actually just deal only with the electrical system. That's called an electrophysiologist. So you're seeing me, I'm a general cardiologist, I'm basically a mechanic, okay? So there's, there's about four or five different types of cardiologists. There's me, who I deal with everything, the electrical system, the tubes, the heart muscle, the valves, the valves are my specialty. Um, but there's another doctor in our clinic, Dr. Swingle, who is called an electrophysiologist who can do kind of fancy things with the electrical system, deal with pacemakers and stuff like that. Then there's plumbers, okay? The plumbers are the people that go back to that other picture I showed you, this one. They basically go into the heart there from your artery in your arm or your leg, and they 
either pull out plaque in general, we tend to not pull out plaque, we push it away. We don't like to do that, we actually like to prevent that plaque from ever being there. So that's why you guys are here. Just to try to take whatever you have, stabilize it, and try to get rid of it before we have to mess with it. Um, so those are the plumbers. And then there's people called congenital heart disease doctors, structural heart disease doctors. We're, we're starting to get even so more specialized that seeing your primary care doctor gets even more important over time because all the cardiologists are getting a little bit not very good at general stuff. Okay? If you met a cardiologist 20 years ago, they very much looked like a primary care doctor. And nowadays we're starting to get very specialized because things are getting complex. We're, and that's only because we're understanding more and more about the heart kind of constantly, daily. It gets more complex. We're like looking at MRIs and things, and, and that takes a lot of training. So that's the world we live in at the moment. Um, I'll keep on going. So that's one of those 3D pictures of the hearts we can do. The reason why I did this on this person is because their mitral valve was leaking a bit, and it was leaking through that hole there, and we ultimately had to repair it. But those are just the things we can do nowadays without even opening you up and without even putting a needle in your arm, which is pretty fun. This is a cardiac skeleton. This is, it's right here. It's these things that hold all your valves together. So I think of your heart kind of like a pair of pants. It has a belt that holds everything together, but everything down here is kind of floppy. Um, and this is the belt, the cardiac skeleton. And it holds all the valves together, but this is all just kind of loose muscle down here. Has anybody heard about heartstrings? In like songs, heartstrings? No? Those are real things? Like you're pulling in my heartstrings? Have you not heard that? Yes. <laughs> Maybe not. People haven't been passionate enough in this room. <laughs> um, so, so heartstrings exist, okay? Or listening to music, which is always with music. Heartstrings actually hold the valves together. So because everything's loose at the bottom, if this is the top part of your heart muscle, it's sitting right here under your left chest. You have these things called papillary muscles that hold the heart strings, okay? And they open and close the valves to allow blood to come in and out. If those heart strings get stretched out, infected, and the valves don't work, you probably end up seeing me. Um, there is a big portion of the population who's super tall, kind of super flexible and, and lanky looking. They have very long heart strings, and they can have leaky valves. So if you've ever met somebody who's very tall and gangly, kind of looks like me a little bit, they can have something called mitral valve prolapse. And has anybody heard of mitral valve prolapse? Mitral valve prolapse basically is this leaflet right here is just too stretched out and leaks a lot just because they're tall. So depending on your size, your heart looks different. So you're super special. Okay, so before we go sit down in the fireside chat, I'll just walk through what happens with your heart, okay? Um, everything's always going forward. Everything should go forward. And if it doesn't go forward, there's trouble. You probably end up seeing me. So think of blood flow is always supposed to be in one direction, like I-5. But if there's traffic and something's blocking it, everything starts to go backwards. That's called congestion. And that's where that term congestive heart failure comes from. So everything that we use in our body, once blood is all used up and done, it comes from our legs down here and up from our arteries and the arms and the head. And it comes either from your head and your arms up there or down from this way. And it's supposed to go on something called your right atrium. It sits there for a second, then it goes down into your right ventricle through something called the tricuspid valve. And the right side of your heart pumps all that deoxygenated blood into your lungs, okay? So there's two hearts, everybody has two hearts, the right heart and the left heart. If you've got lung disease like COPD, if you smoked for a while, if you, if you have sleep apnea, you can have high pressures in your lungs. And the right side of your heart has trouble getting blood that way. So sometimes when you exercise, you get a little short of breath, okay? So blood goes into the lungs, and then oxygen, when you breathe, kind of attaches to that, those red blood cells and comes back to your heart through something called the pulmonary veins on the left side. So you see this picture as blue and red, right? So now it's all oxygenated on the left heart. 
And this is a really strong, really intense part, portion of your heart pumps, and it pumps at very high pressure. Blood is supposed to go down here first and then out. And it goes out your aorta. So when the doctor says you have high blood pressure, what do they really mean? What do we really care about? We're checking your blood pressure right here, right? Most, most of the time. Sometimes you have these blood pressure cuffs on your wrist that I don't like, or the ones that are on the fingers that I really, really dislike. The reason why I dislike anything that's not close to your heart is because it doesn't tell me what's going on right here. I care about what the blood pressure is right in your aorta, because that has direct effects on your heart. It has direct effects on the arteries that supply your heart. So if you tell me what your blood pressure is down here, I'll think about it. Or here, I'll think about it, but I really care about it. What's, what's, what's going on right here? So if you guys have wrist cuffs, finger cuffs, you might want to put them in a closet. So I think that's, I think that's it. Let me see. That's everything. OK, that's the very end. I was wondering, um, just thinking about prevention, um, are there kind of like top four, five, six things we should focus on? Um, and, and of course, is there a difference in men versus women? Sure. So um, a common thing you'll find me say is that all of us do have coronary artery disease. Everybody in this room does. We all started to develop it around the age of 15, 16, 17, 18. That's just because we eat food. And you know, if you go back and look at cavemen before, they, they all died in their 30s because they got eaten by cougars. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we live longer than that now, there's no cougars. Um, but they, they all had coronary artery disease. If you cut their little coronaries up and look at them, there's a little bit of plaque in there. And they're like, well, goodness, they used to eat great. There was no, there were no Oreos back then. There was no McDonald's back then. So what's going on? So why do they have the same problems that I'm having? Um, and the issue is because we all have cholesterol. Our liver creates cholesterol. We all have blood pressure issues. So the, the thing I, in general, tell people is that we all have coronary disease. The question is, is how fast has it grown? And how do we make it stable, all right? So the top kind of four or five things I think about is, what is your risk in general of having a problem with coronary disease? Because we all have it. The question is, is it going to be a problem, OK? And, and the most common causes of having trouble with coronary disease are treating your nut body not well, all right? And that's by allowing your blood pressure to be uncontrolled. That's the most common cause in the United States. Smoking used to be a humongous cause. In the US, it's getting better, not great. Um, diabetes, all right? So diabetes, like I said, kind of injures the vascular walls and can really speed up that coronary artery disease. And I'm just not, I'm a cardiovascular physician, so you know, this stuff happens here, but it happens everywhere, right? So it's happening in your brain, the arteries to your eyeballs, to your kidneys. Um, so just understanding what your risk is and talking to Susan, talking to your other primary care doctors, talking to me about what is my risk? That's the first step. That's the first main thing. Do I have diabetes? Am I a smoker? What can I do to live a little bit better? How do I reduce stress and keep my blood pressure controlled? The next thing is family history. So um, if mom or dad died of a heart attack at 30 years old, 40 years old, that's a real big deal. That means probably your genetics, your DNA, is making your liver put out more cholesterol than a standard person would be. Or that your arteries are just a little bit different. They absorb and, and don't let cholesterol just flow through. Instead, they like that you have a stickier vascular system. So family history is a big deal. Understand your parents' history and what were their risk factors if they had trouble. And your brothers and your sisters are pretty good kind of checks. If your brother is super healthy, say your same age, doesn't smoke, and had a heart attack at 40, that's concerning. Why did that happen, right? But if he was a smoker, a drinker, lived pretty hard, sat around all the time and had a heart attack at 50, that's probably not going to be you if you don't live that way. So family history is the second thing. Awesome. Your cholesterol panel, getting it checked. Um, at least once after the age of 25, which most of you are at this point, but making sure that you check it kind of on the order of once every couple of years, just to make sure your primary care doctor has looked at it. And then exercise. Exercise in general. 
keeps our blood pressure low, it keeps blood flowing. So most of what I say is that you want blood to flow. You want the blood to flow forward, and to keep it going forward, you have to push it forward. It can't just be a very passive thing. That's what I was saying. So um, a lot of people are asking about um, tests, and certainly, you know, seeing your doctor, getting a physical, looking at blood work and so forth, cardiac exam, maybe an EKG, depending. Um, but you know, I get asked a lot about stress tests and treadmills, echoes, um, and uh, kind of a more recent um, test in recent years, which is that calcium score. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, say you don't feel anything. You're just like doing your thing, going to work, you've got a reasonably okay blood pressure, and then you kind of want to know what your risk of coronary artery disease or heart dysfunction or heart failure, all this crazy stuff, stroke, I lump it in together because it's all vascular stuff. Um, there's all sorts of fun tests we can do, but do they actually improve your lifespan? That's the real question I have in my mind when you come to me in clinic. Am I actually helping you by doing something? So if you find, fortunately you live in now, and fortunately there are physicians and a, a system that is trying to do best by you by not over-testing you, okay? So about 20 years ago, we used to do stress tests on almost everybody. We would, we would be like, we can do a stress test, let's find out. The problem with that is if you're not having symptoms of heart problems, it leads to getting procedures that you may not have needed. Getting in the hospital, getting an IV, and having lab and blood drawn from you, or getting contrast that might put you at risk. So, so my kind of the moral of the story is you can do all sorts of tests. The question is what do you need, and do you have symptoms? So you'll find that most primary care doctors, cardiologists, tend to order these things called stress tests only if you're having the symptoms that are common with heart problems, or if you're very high risk. Um, and we kind of assess that. But the question about coronary calcium scores, it's excellent that it actually exists that we can do this. So what is a coronary, does anybody, has anybody heard of this coronary calcium score? Okay. So, Basically, a coronary calcium score is our way of finding out, do you have some plaque in your coronary arteries? Okay, so if you have plaque in your coronary arteries, which all of you do, all of you do I'll just put that in there, there, all of us have it, is how much do you have and where is it, and is it going to cause trouble, and do we need to deal with it? All these kind of questions we need to find out. So if you have plaque in your coronary arteries, what happens is, is there's little micro eruptions of that plaque into the bloodstream. That's normal. There's a normal kind of give and take of that plaque in the coronary arteries. And your body, your body's smarter than I am. It tries to heal that plaque in with calcium, actually. Okay? It lays down this kind of mortar to say, hey, stay out of the blood vessel. I don't I just like you. Get out of get out of here. So fortunately, it's calcium, it's hard, it's like a rock. You've seen kind of calcium carbonate or tums, right? It's kind of limestone and most calcium. So basically what happens is if I put an x-ray through you, if I shoot a gamma photon into your chest, usually it should go, it should keep on going in that direction. Right now, not right now, it's nighttime, but when the sun is out there are photons actually hitting you and going through you even though you think you block them. We shoot x-rays that are special going in a circle around you and it bounces off the calcium and it bounces off the calcium in your coronary arteries and then we actually count it up. We can give you a score between zero, which means I didn't see any calcium at all, to 1,000, 2,000. And if your score is zero, fantastic, good job. You have fantastic genetics, or you're just 20 years old, I don't know which one. Okay, because most of us are gonna have coronary calcium that's there, so don't be afraid if somebody does it and you have coronary calcium. Um, but then if your score is 400, then I'm like, well, there's at least a moderate amount of plaque here. I can't see the plaque, but I can see that the body tried to heal in a bunch of little eruptions. So what do I do about it now? So when we, if I do a coronary calcium score and your score is above 400, you might find most cardiologists do stress tests on those patients. Is that absolutely recommended by all the super smart people in the world? No, they're still arguing about it. I keep on looking at it. I looked at it like two days ago. They still say it's controversial. If it's 1,000, wow, you've got calcium everywhere, you, you needed to see me 10 years ago, okay? So 
in that setting it can be useful. So I tend to use coronary calcium scores not when you're 20 years old, not when you're 70 years old and we already expect you to have it, but I use it when you're anywhere between 40 and 65 and you're unclear about your family history and you want to know, am I doing what I can be doing? Um, the downsides, let me tell you the downsides of coronary calcium scores is radiation. I'm shooting x-rays through you. So when, when a doc does a chest film on you, they shoot a bunch of x-rays in one direction and it's over. A coronary calcium score, you go in a little bit of a CT scanner. You don't get hundreds of thousands of x-rays, which is a CT scan, but you get a couple. You get thousands. It's in the thousands range. So it's about the amount of radiation you would get for living in the world as it is at the moment for about a year. Okay? That's a coronary calcium score. So there is some downside. Because you, you know, you're getting radiation, can we tell you it's going to cause cancer? No, we can't. And smarter people than I am are working on that. But we like all cardiologists, because we do these tests, we like to keep your, your radiation levels super low if we can. So I use it for people who I'm trying to either help you figure out how much risk you have. Are you medium risk? Are you low risk? Or are you high risk? And um, it can be useful in that situation. Um, I was curious about inflammation. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, well, press that even uh, kind of, we talk about inflammation of joints, talk about inflammation of brain, different mouth conditions, and I know that there's inflammation in blood vessels. And um, there's a test maybe some of you have heard called C-reactive protein or highly sensitive C-reactive protein. There's pros and cons of that. I'm curious um, from an inflammation perspective how um, important that is for heart disease to either think about it or measure it or treat it. Sure. So inflammation is super important. That's kind of what we are starting to understand about it at the moment. Um, if you look at the major trial that you're talking about, so there was a trial that actually looked at the CRP levels, C-reactive protein. If the C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker, is really high in you, it can be a lot of things. You can just have an infected joint, and we didn't know that. Or you could have had pneumonia last week. But if everything's been going fine, you don't have joint problems, you don't have rheumatoid arthritis, you don't have lupus, you don't have a recent pneumonia or sick, and your CRP is elevated, I start to worry a little bit about what is the level of inflammation in your vascular system. So you heard me say a little bit earlier that I like the world of your blood vessels to be nice and happy. I like the blood pressure to be low. I like there to be not too much cholesterol flowing through there, the bad cholesterol. Um, and I also like, she brought this up, I like there to be low levels of inflammation. The reason being is, and I'll get up again, but once again, these, these walls of this room are super important. And you have to keep, you have to treat the walls well. And the way you do that is to prevent scratches, prevent cracks in them. So that's a very simplistic way of thinking about it. But inflammation actually increases cracks in the blood vessel walls. You want those blood vessel walls to be like a very strong barrier. You want them to keep everything out of them and keep them happy, because they keep blood flow going. But if there's lupus, if there's rheumatoid arthritis, if there's inflammatory bowel disease, if there's endometriosis in 20-year-old women, there's a risk of coronary artery disease speeding up. All of us have coronary disease. I've said that multiple times. The question is, what's speeding it up? Is it fast or slow? And when are we going to find it? So if you have an inflammatory disorder, get checked out. Find out like, what is your risk of coronary artery disease and how you're doing. So that's what I would say. That's really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've been waiting for this question. Controversial. Um, the whole statin discussion. Um, sure. A lot. It's really on the top of people's minds when we talk about cholesterol and the pharmaceutical industry yep. and really good cardiac research. Um, as a primary care doc, I'm always trying to justify, you know, how do we follow the guidelines, yeah. yet realize some people have a lot of trouble with them, or they can't afford them, or, you know, the list goes on and on. Sure. And I just, I'd like to hear your input as a cardiologist. Sure, yeah, so statins. Statins, there's a lot of different types of statins. They've been out for a while. Um, and from my perspective, I look at everybody's need or not need for it, okay? So there's a lot of people that don't need statins. In general, those are low risk or interme intermediate risk patients that are, in general, asymptomatic. That means you're exercising, you're living your life, you're doing reasonably okay, 
even if you have mildly elevated cholesterol, you don't necessarily need a stat. <coughs> there's something that's telling us that you're higher risk, that you can't control with diet, exercise, living right, keeping the blood pressure low. So stat, let me just tell you what statins do. Okay, so there's lots of different types of anti-cholesterol medications. All of them work in different ways. There was one that was developed earlier that you, it's called Zetia. You swallow it, it binds cholesterol, you poop it out. There's also other different ones. Um, they cause lots of indigestion issues, and they're still very expensive for some reason. I don't understand why. But they are. Yeah. So maybe that's because the pharmaceutical companies want us to have statins, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so statins as well, what do statins do? Um, they actually reduce your liver's ability to create cholesterol. So people think that when you are eating a steak, that that is the problem with your cholesterol. Or if you're having a stick of butter, your cholesterol is going to be super high. But we forget that there's two ways that cholesterol gets in your, in your body. You create it in the first place. You need it. You need it for brain function. You need it for eye function. You need it for higher cognitive skills. You need it for all sorts of things. Um, and your liver creates it at a regular basis. And then you eat it. You eat it from plants that have made it, that made it, and you also eat it from animals that were making it in their livers. Right? So if you eat liver of other an animal, you're getting a higher level of cholesterol. Um, what statins do is they reduce your liver's ability to actually produce cholesterol. And then your liver gets confused, and it's like, why is there no cholesterol in me? So what your liver does is it actually puts receptors of cholesterol out on the outside of your liver, and your liver becomes a sponge of cholesterol. It starts scrubbing cholesterol out of your system really well. And the type of cholesterol it takes out is LDL in general. LDL being the low density lipoprotein, which is this little tiny torpedoes of evil cholesterol. <laughs> tiny torpedoes. What they do is that they're little, little guys that are floating around. You can't see them, obviously. I imagine them. But what they do is they're just like constantly flowing around and they're waiting for that, that wall crack. They're waiting for that inflammatory vessel and they just stick right in there. Then there's, your liver also creates this kind of thing called HDL. And HDL is big and beautiful and fluffy and it looks like the moon. And what it does is it's floating around and because it has its own mass and gravity, it actually scrubs up LDL. So just like the Earth is sitting right here and the Moon is kind of out there. Earth, think of Earth like the HGL, and the Moon is the LDL, and the Earth is trying to hold on to that. So if you have Earth, lots of little Earths flowing through your blood vessels, it's trying to scrub out the little moons, right? Um, so statins actually reduce that cholesterol production in your liver, put out all these receptors, and then your liver becomes a sponge, and your LDL starts to drop. Okay? So, there are people who cannot tolerate statins very well. And there's specific statins that are, tend to be a little bit more offenders. The offenders are the sticky statins, I call them, okay? So the, the statins that actually sit in the muscles. And that can cause sometimes muscle pain. Not everybody, okay? So if you look at the data that I read, in general, it says, oh, there's very low risk. It's like less than 1% of patients. But we, people who work every day understand that, you know, people are people and everybody's different, there's probably a little bit a higher amount of that, that, you know, maybe anywhere between 10 and 20% of people who take a statin feel something. It's not necessarily that, it like, oh my god, my leg hurts, I can't take this, I'm going to die, I can't be on the statin. But oftentimes it's when they're working out, they feel in the large muscles, it tends to be these ones in particular for some reason, don't ask me why. You get muscle pain. The question is why. And what ended up happening is, a lot of people went on statins in the 1980s, 90s, and they really did reduce the risk of stroke and heart disease because they, they killed off those little torpedoes. So I actually do think statins work. They do reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack approximately by 30% if you are an intermediate or high-risk patient. That's a lot of people. One in five people, 20% reduction in all-cause dying, just dying from anything. Actually, statins do help. But there are people who have trouble with it. The question is why? It tends to be the sticky statins, that's the, the stronger ones. But there are ones that are more related that look like water. Those are, I call them hydrophilic statins. They kind of
come in and out of your muscles and they don't cause the symptoms as much. And then they get your cholesterol down. So statin debate is ongoing. In general, it should be one. Go ahead. What happens to your liver? Yeah, yeah. so, because right. Because if, you, if it's putting out receptors and pulling out that right. cholesterol into your liver, does that mean that now you're coming out with a fatty liver? Yeah, so that's the question. So that was a concern early on. And what, what doctors used to do is we used to check liver function tests all the time. We would check your liver function test the day we put you on a statin. We'd do it three months later, six months later, nine months later. That just cost a lot of money and hurt a lot of people because what happens is the, this, the liver is also a smart organ. It excretes all that cholesterol into your bile, and the bile goes in the gut, and you poop it out. So the, the incidence or the, the ability of your liver to have trouble with that is pretty low. Your liver, its primary function is to be a sponge for everything in your body. That's what it's supposed to be there for. So it, may, it knows how to get rid of overloads of certain things. If you're starting off with a liver that's not functioning well because you're drinking a lot, right? Or you already have liver cancer, or you had hepatitis or HIV, and you're on certain medications. Yeah, that's why you should probably talk to me about being on step. And there's alternatives. Okay? So you're it's a very super smart question. Yeah, but your liver figures it out. Well, oh, that's a perfect segue. I think we should just open it up and give a lot of questions. Um, yeah. Well, I, my doctor increased um, my statin drug, and this is going back mm, a year or more ago, mm -hmm. and, um, and what I started noticing is I was getting more and more forgetful, mm -hmm. and then I read that statin drugs can cause that, but it's a possible side effect. So I asked her if she felt like we could cut the statin drugs back and see if that impacted what was going on. And it really did seem to make a difference. So there are some people who are on a little bit stronger statins that can get some mental fogginess. The question is, is whether or not it's related to the amount of cholesterol you need for your brain to function. Because you do need cholesterol for your brain to function. Um, the real big concern that I have in general when somebody comes to me with that is what is that person, again, it comes to the basic questions. What is that person's risk? What is going to hurt this person? Is it something called vascular dementia? Is it because you're going to have frequent recurrent strokes as you get older? And is that going to cause problems in your mobility and ability to live and enjoy your life? Or are you, you having mental fogginess for some other reason? I don't know. Um, the, there has been no evidence that it increases the risk of dementia based on randomized control trials. That's a crappy answer. It just means that we haven't found evidence that it absolutely does it. So in general, your doctor did the absolutely right thing, is to reduce the dose. In general, reduce the frequency and see if it helps. Because you are an individual. You're not a population. You're not a study, right? So your doctor did the right thing because statins have different side effects and different it's, it's actually your genetics. So the big statin debate is actually, it's made us, it forced us to understand what statins do in people. Because in general, we put, a, put them on a lot of people, and they help to reduce the risk of stroke and heart attack, and they do that. The problem is, I don't know what your background is. Asians have an ability to tolerate amazing doses of them, and we don't understand why. <laughs> Caucasians from different parts of Europe, different parts of the Middle East have higher levels of this enzyme that can break statins down. There are some people from like Norway and Sweden that have not enough of them, and they have trouble. They have myalgias. They might have mental fogginess. So the right thing to do is to reduce the dose because what's happening is this, it's building up in your system too much. So your body, if you take a statin like on Monday and you take it on Tuesday, the question is, did you, you actually break down the, the statin that you had on Monday? We don't know. We can't tell because we haven't done specific tests on you. We don't check statin levels in bloodstreams. Um, the right thing to do is allow your body to break it down. So if, if you're, you'll find that if you come to me and you've had statin trouble and you're high risk or intermediate risk, I'm actually going to retry the statin.
because over the last about three to five years, we've gotten much better at understanding the metabolism of the drug. So we, I reduced the dose and reduced the frequency. People tend to feel better like almost immediately, kind of like you did. So you kind of sneak it in the system, and do you hope to eventually get to a kind of a sure. level that works that you can just kind of do it over a period of time? Right. So, um, and and I, just, I talk kind of casually about it, but this is backed up with data. So smarter doctors than me, who don't just practice medicine all day, did studies on this. And they reduced the dose, changed the frequency to maybe Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The symptoms go down, but the cholesterol continues to fall because the drug is so effective. The problem is you want to be very careful to hit the targets that your doctor achieves. Um, and you'll find that taking a drug, sometimes it's just easier when you know you're going to take it every day. So you don't like, what is today? Did I take it yesterday? So you'll find that compliance goes down. So people forget, right? They forget to brush their teeth sometimes. They forget to take their statin. And then people start having heart attacks. But if you're a patient who like totally is with it and your alarm is set to take it, we're totally willing to do it. Because um, it's going to improve your life span, your quality of life. So um, yes, it has been looked at. It does keep you alive, and it still has a, a similar benefit if you're going to take it. Yeah. Other questions you have? Go ahead. Best advice on getting off the staff once you're on it? Yeah, so if you've been on it for years and years, and the question is, why? Is it because of symptoms? And then the next question is, what is your risk? And what are the alternatives? Okay, so going off the statin is relatively easy. That's the black and white. You can just stop it. Okay, you can just stop it. And you got to tell your doctor because your doctor cares about you and wants to still reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack. Because you are you. You know, you're not going to hurt me if you're not on the statin. Um, but there are alternatives now, okay? So we've understood that statins can cause side effects and people don't like taking them. And the problem is there's a lot of information on the internet that's really hard for people to understand what to do next. So people in their minds are like, well, because it's so controversial, because I'm feeling yucky, eh, screw this. I'm probably going to just stop it for now. Um, pharmaceutical companies are smart about that. And what they did about 20 years ago is they started develop something called PCSK9 inhibitors, okay? Have you guys heard of those? So it's a long term, I'm not gonna tell you what it means, but basically it's the first statin alternative that does something very similar to a statin and doesn't have the side effects that statins have, all right? The problem is they just came out like six to eight months ago, and because of that, they're abhorrently expensive. It's starting to get into the thousands of dollars per month, is like outrageous to me. However, I tend to use it for people who can't be on statins who really, 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 really need it, have like 15 stents in their heart, you know, two bypasses, all the strokes, they really need it, you know. So I guarantee you, if you live long enough, when those things become generic, you likely will be dead for it. What are those medications? They reduce LDL by increasing the receptor on your liver, but it's a once a month kind of, it's either twice a month shot. I know that sounds crazy. But what it is, it's an antibody, so it's just a shot. Um, or once a month, or twice a month. And what it does is it doesn't sit in the muscles, and it doesn't it need your body to metabolize it because it's an antibody. Like all the other antibodies people have for like rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. I just wish I could prescribe them just because they in general have low risk profile, but we have no idea how long we, we don't have any long-term outcome data. We have great long-term outcome data for statins. I know they reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack pretty significantly. And if you're able to tolerate a specific one, it might be a hard journey to get to the right one for you to at least reduce your LDL by a specific amount. Then I'd rather you be on that because in general it's cheap. And I know that it's not going to overall hurt you in the long run. One thing that strikes me um, thinking about prevention of heart disease or treatment of risk factors is um, that many of them are without symptoms. So, you know, high blood pressure, unless it's so high you're having a stroke, or high cholesterol over years or even decades, people don't feel any different. And I think that's, that's the hard sell because they're on a medicine, they think, well, 
Yeah, that's true. It makes me actually feel maybe not so good, and I don't see the difference. Where right. if you look at some of the research, we're concerned about you know the risk profile, perhaps. That's right. And they're just thinking about doing a death and feel yucky. So that's people hate taking that's a little dilemma. <laughs> you know, like if you're if you've got a handful of pills in the morning, and you feel a little crummy at like 30 minutes after taking them, and you still feel the same you did you know 20 years ago, and you still have the same problems. You're like, how's this really helping me? It really is. Um, it's a difference between understanding your risk, like Dr. Von Barbel said, and and looking. The problem is in the media. There's not really. They don't really show you kind of the bad side of, of not taking the medications. They want you to consume more, do more, take more medications, continue to eat, um, you know, Oreos, and go to parties, and then also take the medications. Um, and you'll find that being part of this class, living well, keeping your blood pressure controlled, can actually get you off the medications, right? So my job, in general, is to work with people to reduce the risk when you're in it, when you're, everything's wrong, everything's going wrong, you're feeling short of breath, your cholesterol's uncontrolled, you have high blood pressure. I help cover you during that period so you can join classes like this. And eventually, we try to get the medications off. Um, because not all the medications are needed for life. And I love to stop your meds. <laughs> yeah. I think there's so many positive things that everyone's done. Everyone, I'm looking at everyone here uh, to really make strides in that department. And that's, that's, that's the win-win, for sure. Yeah. Long story short, you can stop it. Tell somebody you did that. And see if there are alternatives. Well, not so much what, I guess, what's your number one recommendation to reduce your risk? So you can get off anything. Oh, okay, I see. In general, for me, that's that's a that's a tough question, but um, I would say, from my perspective, yeah. um, people who are so successful have really looked at behavior changes that have led them to sustain dietary changes that are positive. That I mean, everything we're we're talking about here, and they've improved their exercise. Hopefully, they've lost the weight. I mean, that whole cocktail literally is the key to success. Of yeah. Getting, getting off. Now, now keep in mind. I mean, you can come in this. Unfortunately, there's that little, you know, hereditary problem. Some people have a family history, and it's sure. trying. It doesn't matter how they can be athletes and put my diet to shame, and they're still high. So right. That, yeah, that you can't get around genetics. That's the that's the downside. But yeah, I do agree that in general, the things that I find that get people out of the woods, my woods. You don't want to be in my woods in general, but I can walk you through them. Um, is activity levels and eating right so you know taking a look at the food that you're eating and asking yourself if it's real go ahead well then can i can i ask a follow-up question sure Since we you know we now have the opportunity to have these little hand sure. devices mm -hmm. um talking with dr kira Baum, who's another provider in this program working with her to think about moving more than once a day so in other words i have been trying to get to health club once a day sure but now i'm thinking it may make more sense. I really need to take more breaks through the day. Do you see any patterns in sure. your work? And it doesn't have to be excessive, just a walk stairs. Right, so anywhere you can fit it in to be like what we used to be. That's, that's what I'd say. We have evolved. I think we've devolved a little bit, let's be honest. Okay, so when humans became humans from what we previously were, we used to be running away from things that were trying to kill us constantly. <laughs> we didn't eat much. We really didn't eat much, okay? So we were eating way more calories in general than we need. And we are, in general, not moving enough. And our jobs, like my job, makes me like sit and type all the time. So I, try, I do have this too, right? And I see how much my activities levels are. It tells me to get up and stand. I do that naturally, but yeah, if you have the ability to avoid that elevator, walk up the stairs, huff and puff. I tend to tell my patients that I'd really like you to break a sweat. I want you to feel uncomfortable daily. Because you did when you evolved, and that's how you were made at the moment, and our genetics has not changed just yet. It will, it will. We will, unfortunately, if we don't really understand of how we're supposed to live, we probably over time will um, be extinguished from this earth, I think. Um, you know, because we're not what we were. Um, so please, be active. Eat real food. It's a big thing. I'm, I'm sure she talks about that all the time. 
Does this activity question we're talking about, does that impact inflammation? Is that part of the yes, uh, absolutely. ways this is working? Absolutely. So one of the jokes I tend to make in clinic, and I'm dead serious in general, is that you know things that look like cocaine probably are not good for you too. Sugar, sugar. Things that look like cocaine is a very simple thing, right? So cocaine is intensely inflammatory and it speeds up atherosclerosis. Anything in its pure chemical form, humans were not supposed to have. It's not supposed to be in your system. You know, plastics, chemicals, preservatives, sugar, 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 salt, right? Salt looks like cocaine too. They've been talking in the news lately, though, about how salt, the, the salt got a bad rap and how it's really not that bad for you or whatever, but... It's news. That's the trouble. So who is the news? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's our current political landscape as well. Right? Yeah. We won't get into that. But in yeah. general, yeah, salt in general, it allows us to function outside of the sea because we... If you believe in evolution, we probably came from the sea, and we probably had air bladders, and we moved on. We have to eat salt to function. Salt is in every single one of your cells, and it creates certain things that allow that heart to pump. Your heart pumps on a sodium channel, for goodness sake. So you need salt. The question is, how much salt, right? We Americans eat about 12 grams of salt a day. 12 grams. We are supposed to eat, in general, to survive 1.5 grams? I don't know, or maybe less, I don't know. I'm not a nutritionist, unfortunately. But we all eat maybe three, four, or five times as much salt as we should be eating. What does that do to your body? Inflammation is one of them. Most commonly, salt, you know, if you, if I give you like a tablespoon of salt, what are you gonna do? You're gonna like go grab some water quickly. The reason being is salt holds onto water. Little bits tend to like water, because your body is trying to make it equivalent. Guess what happens then? Your blood pressure starts to go up. And then what happens is there's cracks in the walls. And then what happens is that cholesterol you ate, those little torpedoes, and... And, and the kidneys are not happy. Yep. <laughs> so over four trillion beats, those little torpedoes are going to cause trouble. So it's all related to what you eat. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, about four years ago, got diagnosed with severe sleep apnea. Yeah. Does that raise my risk for heart disease or congestive heart failure or pulmonary disease? Okay, so sleep apnea. I use my CPAP every night. <laughs> That's right. Congratulations. So, thank you. So, you know, obstructive sleep apnea does lead, in general, to progressive fatigue and something called pulmonary hypertension. What is that? That's elevated pressures inside of your lungs. Okay, do people develop terrible heart failure from obstructive sleep apnea? Right only side heart failure. Right side heart failure. Only in the worst case scenarios. Okay. Definitely not you when you're using your CPAP mask. It definitely, what, what using your CPAP mask does, it makes you feel better so that you can be more active and not get in a car accident, which will make your life short. <laughs> All right. And it'll allow you to exercise, because when you have low blood pressures in your, in your lungs, your heart has has the ability to pump blood easily, and you can do more. Um, so it makes you more functional, and, and when you're more functional, you live longer. So I shouldn't be getting an echo right now. No, or anything like absolutely that. not, because Excellent. you're treating it already. Excellent. Yeah, um, unless you're short of breath. All right, okay. okay. So you know, the, I think of like a pyramid of symptoms that in general people come to see me for. On the top of that, in general, shortness of breath. There's a lot of reasons to cause shortness of breath. Usually you start off with your primary care doctor and talk to them about it, tell them what you're feeling, and they decide what they in general should do before you should see me. But I can also walk you through it. Shortness of breath, the other one's chest pressure, okay? So not that really is sharp pain that's kind of random. Sharp pain tends to not be from the heart. The heart creates a dullish pain because the heart does not have nerves that supply it like your eyeballs and your fingers. If I prick Dr. Susan uh, Baumgartel's finger, she's going to know where I pricked her finger. But if your heart's hurting, it radiates pain into random areas. And those random areas in general are central chest pressure underneath your substernum, like right here. Can radiate to the jaw, to the left arm, to the right arm, to your back. Okay? Um, and they tend to cause shortness of breath with it. You get a little sweaty when you're sitting around. I should probably know, know about those symptoms. You can just call. Any 
Yeah. receptors, they're not needed anymore uh, because your liver starts to produce more cholesterol after you stop the step. So, so your liver is like, oh, I've got plenty of step of cholesterol. I don't need lots of receptors. So what happens is those receptors degrade and they get broken down into the little, little pieces and they're used for something else. We are incredibly fascinating beings. I'm impressed we're even walking around. <laughs> I'm completely fascinated daily. Um, so our body figures it out gets rid of them. So those PCSK9 inhibitors I was talking about, those yeah. newer things that we have that don't cause the symptoms, that get your LDL down to like 20. It's scary how good they are. Um, what they do is actually they prevent the degradation of the receptor. There's a little antibody that kills off this thing that brings the receptor down out of your liver. So you just have more receptors in general that are ready to catch cholesterol. They just stay there until you're off the PCSK9. I think it was CNN meter. Well, um, yeah. this has been fantastic. Cool. If people want to stay and pull the yeah. chair and kind of work <laughs> ourselves out. Yeah, I'm getting hot. Please stay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, if you have to go, yeah. drive safely. But I just want to say thank you so much. You're welcome. It was wonderful. Yeah, thank no you. problem. Thank you.